What is antisocial personality disorder and how does it relate to narcissistic personality disorder? Psychopaths. Are they born or are they made? And how does all that happen? Does the environment matter when you're dealing with a psychopath? Plus, what does the term antisocial really mean? Well, that's what we're talking about today at queenbeing.com. So let's get started. Closed captioning provided by Athena Moberg and cptsdfoundation.org. My name is Angie Atkinson and on this channel I offer free daily video coaching to help you discover, understand, and overcome narcissistic abuse and toxic relationships. I like to call it toxic relationship rehab. So if that sounds good to you, hit that subscribe button and let's get going. A number of studies have found that there's evidence of a biological basis for psychopathy, including the lack of empathy. How do we know this? Let's start by looking at the studies done on various sets of identical twins, each of whom share an identical set of genes. The twins that were studied were also raised separately and we see that when one twin has an antisocial behavioral disorder so does the other in most cases. So when one twin has antisocial behavioral history so does the other in most cases. This is likely to lead to the idea that there is in fact a genetic predisposition for psychopathy and other ASPDs. But what is it about a person's genes that could make a person turn into a psychopath? And is it just the genes? Well, these twin studies have also shown that when it comes to psychopathic traits, including the lack of guilt and remorse, directly and carelessly using and abusing other people, and the lack of empathy, among other traits, well, all of these generated similar, similar results, all of these studies. So when one twin showed the traits, the other was also likely to do so. While it doesn't entirely confirm what researchers believe is true, it certainly doesn't negate it. One recent study found that kids as young as seven years old can demonstrate psychopathic qualities. That's scary, right? Even more recently, studies have been done on the brains of people who are psychopaths that have really cleared things up. After having CAT scans done on a series of psychopaths, researchers noticed that the part of the brain usually associated with your emotions, especially the integration of emotion and thoughts with actions, doesn't operate the same way that a normal person's brain does. So for example, if you were to show a normal person a picture of something that most people would feel strong emotions about, like a mother holding her new baby, you know, right after birth, you guys know what I'm talking about, you ever see those pictures of on Facebook or whatever, they're still in the hospital bed, the mom just had the baby, that feeling, or a wedding, something that makes a normal person feel some kind of emotion. Normal people have this emotion center in their brain that kind of lights up when that happens. But when it came to showing the same images to a psychopath, that part of the brain never responds. There's literally no activity there. The emotional response appears dormant. And the same goes for a bunch of other emotions. The emotional areas of the brain just sort of stay dark for these people. They never show any activity. So at the very least, it looks like there's a genetic influence on the ability to experience empathy and to feel strong emotions such as guilt, empathy, remorse, or any emotions at all. Usually, of course, guilt, empathy, remorse, these are, these are the same emotions that would prevent most of us from killing or hurting another human being or doing something horrible to them from committing violent crimes. This all adds up to the fact that there's most likely a biological component here to psychopathy. There's a biological component to psychopathy most likely. But while this might seem like a relief for some people, maybe a big problem for some people, it's really not as simple as that. See, because there are also other factors to consider, like environmental factors, or are there? Does the environment affect the development of a psychopath? That's the question. That's what we're going to talk about because studies on psychopathy definitely show some interesting facts here. So first, about half of the differences between psychopathic traits are genetic. That seems to suggest that there's also an environmental influence. And 40 to 60 percent of the variance between other personality traits and other personality disorders, when we're talking about those characteristics or those traits again, might reflect genetic factors as well, according to research. So what does that mean? Well, clearly psychopathy is a lot like those other traits and disorders in which genetic factors are important, but they don't explain everything. So while specific genes that are related to psychopathy haven't quite been identified yet. Researchers also believe that there are multiple genes that may contribute to the development of a psychopath. So most diagnosable genetic conditions would involve multiple genes. So it's not like just one single gene that leads one to become a psychopath. So it's not like we could just isolate a certain specific gene. Another twins study examined the influence of the environmental factors and the psychopathic 
traits. How did the environmental factors influence the psychopathic traits and the development and expression of them? The bottom line there, I'm not going to go through all the details because you'll be bored, I'm sure. But the bottom line there is that the research proved that the environment and the way that they were treated, the individual people were treated by their parents and other people that were inside of that environment, has a pretty serious influence on the way a person turns out. We already knew this. Here's the thing. If a person is pre-genetically disposed to being a psychopath and these environmental factors are in place, then the development is almost certain. Whether or not a person is genetically predisposed is, is a factor. But it also, in order to have that expressed or in order to have that come out, a person needs to also have, in most cases, are these environmental circumstances. So that, st that study actually led researchers to caution people and to say, listen, if you have at-risk children, if you see kids who are displaying antisocial behaviors young, or they are displaying poor impulse control too early, then, or in general, then you should take them to see a psychological or a psychiatric professional ASAP so that you could avoid or help prevent the development of a psychopath. What do you think about that? Tell me in the comments below, do you think that's a legitimate thing to tell parents or not? I, I worry that they would over-medicate some children. They, they were saying that the, in the studies that children as young as seven years old could be affected by psychopathy, which I found very interesting. So while sociopaths can be produced through just the environmental influence, not to mention the social ones, psychopaths must be, according to what we understand, genetically determined. And while both psychopathy and sociopathy are linked or similar, and while we're at it, NPD, under the big umbrella that is ASPD or antisocial personality disorder, there are various schools of thought that clearly distinguish the two. So the way that a person is brought up could cause a person to act like a psychopath but not be a psychopath, more, more directly a sociopath. So sociopaths then are more the products of the adverse environmental experience that affects their automatic nervous system and neurological development and that may lead them to physiological responses that are similar to those of psychopaths. Does that make sense? So antisocial personality do disorder then and its umbrella is considered a legal and a clinical label that may be applied to both psychopaths and sociopaths. I find it all very interesting. Like, what does the term antisocial mean? Does it pertain to their behavior or does it, does it mean that they kind of live on the fringes of society in like a log cabin out in the middle of nowhere and they don't like people? That's a great question. First of all, I think that we have several different meanings for that word because I think there's obviously the, what, the antisocial personality disorder. And then there's like a person who says, oh, I'm antisocial because they're kind of an introvert. And then of course you've got your, I hate people person, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and to be perfectly honest with you, I am a little bit I don't want to be around people all the time sometimes. You know, like every day I need an hour by myself without even my family. But I don't have antisocial personality disorder. I think it's a multi-pronged answer. I guess my question is, are we talking about antisocial personality disorder or as it would apply to a psychopath or a sociopath? Or are we talking about the commonly understood term? What, what would you say to all of that? I think she was talking about the personality disorder, but this tripped me up for a very long time when I first came across the term, even though I had education about it and, you know, all of this, I still had this under, I was confusing asocial for antisocial. And oh, a, good point. Okay. So like asocial is sort of like, hey, I'm not really into being social. Right. Uh, I'm more introverted. I'm just like not liking to be around people. Antisocial is how a person's behavior pertains to like how basically how they handle frustration, how they navigate through life. So you can either have like pro-social behavior or you have antisocial behavior. And social behavior as as far as like different kind of implied or stated social contracts. I think especially as, as it would pertain to like a person get either getting their needs and wants met or how a person handles like conflict and frustration. Like if a person gets frustrated, a pro-social way, let's say they, they hate their marriage, right? They're just miserable. A pro-social way would be to get divorced. Um, yeah, yeah. An antisocial way would be to either threaten your partner or kill them. If your person's having stress at work, a pro-social way would be to be assertive. An antisocial way would be to become very like sabotaging and manipulative and uh, destructive. And that's confusing because a lot of like antisocial personality disordered people are incredibly charming and very likable, very charismatic. And they come across as often like, you know, the Bill Cosby's of the world having a lot of really pro-social behavior. Mm. And because they are so likable and they may, they may be even 
you know, a, a pu- I mean, he's an extreme, but like a very public figure, it can be confusing to targets when they hear that word antisocial because they're like, well, this guy's not like the Unabomber. I mean, he's not like living right. out in a shack on the fringe of society. But yeah, it's the same personality disorder, but it comes across in a wide variety of ways. Um, that's that's really insightful. And we already know what narcissistic personality disorder is, right, NPD? But just in case you're new here, I'm just going to quickly review for you the clinical definition. So NPD is a personality disorder that causes the affected person to have a pretty distorted self-image, unpredictable and intense emotional issues, and most notably, a serious lack of empathy for the people around them. Of course, the lack of empathy leads them to not be able to feel or understand feelings that aren't their own, and clearly this causes some pretty serious issues in relationships. Someone with NPD may also have a sense of superiority and a grandiose fantasies of power or importance, not to mention a huge sense of often unearned entitlement, and they may consider themselves and their ideas more important or more correct than anyone else's. Now we're going to quickly cover the diagnostic criteria for APD or antisocial personality disorder. Here we see similar traits, including a propensity for egocentricism and self-directed goal setting without regard for societal norms or rules. Personality traits also include a propensity for manipulating and deceiving other people in their lives, hostility, and a sense of callousness. Also present are irresponsible and impulsive behaviors, excessive risk-taking, and other behaviors that are considered outside of societal norms. It's a little confusing, isn't it? Maybe because there are so many different similarities there. For example, a narcissist will be uncomfortable in situations where they are not the center of attention, and so will the antisocial person. Both narcissists and people with APD can be very dramatic, and each of them likes to really feel like they're the center of the world. Both the narcissist and the person with APD will typically victimize other people, and while the narcissist does seem to lack empathy, the antisocial social person has a reckless disregard for the safety of other people. Slightly different, but pretty similar, right? Of course, there are also some very marked differences between the two, and that's what we're going to cover next. So first up, let's talk about NPD versus APD on attention from other people. Probably the most notable difference is that in most cases, even if the narcissist breaks the law, they're usually not caught. They're pretty slick about it. For the antisocial person, though, being arrested at some point in their lives, pretty common. Narcissists also really need their sources of supply in order to self-validate, their sources of narcissistic supply. When it comes to their personal identities, the narcissist tends to base their self-esteem on how other people react to them and treat them. So they tend to have an exaggerated sense of self that fluctuates to desperate self-doubt, which is usually not verbalized by the narcissist openly. Narcissists are also known for their emotional extremes and their mood swings. Now, some narcissists do verbalize it like those who are of the the uh, vulnerable type, the covert type. Sometimes they seem to feel like complaining about how bad their life sucks helps, but most narcissists won't do it. Narcissists are also known for their extreme mood swings. Now let's talk about NPD versus APD on self-esteem and personal goals. So the antisocial personality derives self-esteem from their own personal gain, power, pleasure, not so much through the approval of other people, unlike the narcissist. They will aggressively and openly go after whatever they want without regard for the concerns or feelings of other people involved. They want power. They want control. They want material gain. They want stuff. The APD person is going to focus mostly on functional benefits as opposed to the narcissist who focuses on getting their supply needs met. The ego is more important to the narcissist than it is to the APD person. It makes sense then that the narcissist's goals are generally based on getting approval from other people and the need to see him or herself as special or different. The narcissist doesn't really know why they do what they do in most cases. And like I mentioned, they have kind of a big sense of (laughs) entitlement. The antisocial personality has goals that are more based on personal gratification and that seems confusing, right? But this type of person lacks concern for societal standards, doesn't give a shit what anybody thinks about them when going after what they want. NPD versus APD on relationships. Let's go there, shall we? Here's an interesting note on empathy for both personality disorders. This one is... I find this fascinating. While we know that both NPD and APD affected people lack empathy for others, the APD person also lacks remorse when hurting or mistreating another person. Well, it would seem like so does the NPD person, right? While the same appears to be true for the narcissist, here is this interesting twist. The narcissist tends to be 
hypersensitive toward the reactions of other people, at least as long as they relate to the narcissist directly. The narcissist also seriously underestimates the effect of his or her behavior on other people. Seriously underestimates the effect of his or her behavior on other people. Narcissists need relationships because they help to provide the narcissist with validation and recognition, while antisocial people will build and discard relationships simply for their own financial or social gain. When the relationships end, narcissists, as we all know, are known to hoover or try to suck their exes back in, while the ASP will walk away, the, the antisocial person will walk away without a second thought, like as though that person never affected them at all because in some ways they didn't. When it comes to sex and intimacy, the antisocial personality disordered person is not capable of having a mutually intimate relationship with someone. They are all about exploiting other people to get what they want and sex and intimacy unfortunately are no exception. It's the only way they know to relate to people. The APD will use bullying and intimidation to control the people around them. Well, for narcissists, relationships are all about getting supply, getting their needs met. The narcissist enters relationships to serve him or herself only, to boost self-esteem and fulfill the needs of the narcissist. Here is where other people are damaged the most by the narcissist, in intimate relationships, not always, but in close connected relationships. Sexual relationships, parent-child relationships, even in some cases work relationships or friendships. See, because narcissists are most often abusive to those people who are closest to them. And they tend to have very little interest in the experiences of other people, which leads to their relationship partners feeling unheard and unimportant in most cases. The antisocial personality also includes manipulative behavior through seduction and charm, like the narcissist does sometimes, but for different reasons. The narcissist does it for supply and attention, while the ASP person does it just to meet his or her personal goals or generally just for personal gain. The ASP is more likely to be blatantly callous and sadistic, deceitful, and to commit fraud. They are more openly hostile and mean to other people than narcissists believe it or not. Narcissists are more likely to reserve the worst of their behaviors for those who already have become established sources of narcissistic supply, again because the narcissist cares what strangers think about them or what people they consider better than them or as good as them think about them. Narcissists are less likely to take big risks when it comes to endangering their lives or their financial well-being, things like that. They're not entirely unlikely, but they're less likely. And they're less likely to, to engage in very dangerous behaviors while the ASP is all about both of those things. In fact, ASPs are known to be incredibly impulsive and irresponsible. Many narcissists are financially and socially responsible as far as anyone can tell anyway, but that's because they're also very concerned with their personal image and what other people think about them. The ASP tends to lack the ability to be financially or, and socially responsible at all and really, really struggles to follow through on things that they promise they'll do and on agreements, legal or otherwise. Let's talk about the NPD versus APD on emotions. Narcissists have emotions and they let everybody know it. But the antisocial personality person's brain is wired differently. Neuroscientists have said that the prefrontal cortex of the brain has structural and functional issues that cause the person with antisocial personality disorder to have an inability to have remorse and genuine emotion. While narcissists struggle to display remorse and genuine emotion in a normal, healthy way, it's because they are too self-centered sometimes to pay attention to or to respect the feelings of other people. Not because they can't feel anything, just because they're so self-focused. While the person with antisocial personality disorder genuinely cannot experience normal human feelings at all. They genuinely cannot experience normal human emotion. It's kind of sad. People with narcissistic personality disorder can be affected by depression, anxiety, but people who have antisocial personality disorder cannot. There's another difference. Both. NPD and APD people can experience drug and alcohol addiction, as you may or may not be aware, but again, for different reasons. The APD person does it to indulge in risk-taking and impulsive behavior, as is part of his or her nature, while the NPD person does it to self-medicate in some cases or even to impress other people in some cases. 
Let's talk about NPD versus APD on revenge. The narcissist will feel wounded when his or her pride kind of feels attacked or when someone doesn't agree with him or her. And the narcissist may seek revenge for the narcissistic injury they get out of that deal. While the APD person doesn't give one single shit as to what anyone else thinks about them. They don't care, that's not their problem, that's your problem. But they will react with anger or aggression if their personal goals for material or personal gain are affected. See the difference there? Here's another question. Can someone be both narcissistic and have antisocial personality disorder? Can they have both NPD and APD together? Unfortunately, yes, the two con conditions can be comorbid, but not very often. According to my research, the symptoms, you know, while obviously they do have a little overlap, the specific diagnostic criteria are so specific in the motivations involved that it's very rare that you will actually see someone with both NPD and APD in an individual person. Share your thoughts, share your ideas, share your experiences in the comment section below and let's talk about it. Let me just offer a really quick shout out to my amazing inner circle, the people who clicked that join button or the link in the description below if your device is incompatible and who are supporting my mission here at YouTube. Take a look. Thank you to my amazing channel members, Angela Falsetta, Susan Marion, Roxanne Antle, Deborah, Black Caesar, Life's Revival, Trisha Wolf, Jen Archer, James F., and Marlene. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. I sincerely appreciate that you connected with me and that you're helping me to further my mission and to continue helping our Spanily and anyone who needs help to discover, understand, and overcome narcissistic abuse and toxic relationships. Thank you so much. All right, that's all I've got for you right now. But as always, thank you so much for being a part of my day and a part of my life. And thanks for letting me be a part of yours. It really does mean a lot to me. Now, before I go, make sure you take a look at the videos I'm leaving for you right there and right there. And while you're here, hit that subscribe button right there so we can stay connected and continue on this healing journey together. I'll see you soon.